Bob Crow, General Secretary of the <laughs> Thank you, President, uh, Conway's brothers and sisters, and it's uh, a pleasure but a displeasure that we've got to spend our time here today to talk about how the railways should operate in the future. <coughs> Young Billy here, without embarrassing him, whose father was a train driver in London Underground, an activist within the RNZ, has asked to shadow me today because he intends to go into, into politics. Uh, he said, what should I do regarding politics? What's your advice for? I said, the best thing to do is don't go into Westminster, that's the best thing. <laughs> and he's been shadowing me. That's all right now, it's 10 to 1. He ain't done bad so far, he's seen six bubs in a betting office, so he ain't done bad. He'll <laughs> <laughs> you know what life's about, my five o'clock tonight, we finish it. <laughs> then he's off for the, the Brentford uh, Stevenage match tonight, which may a bit be demeaning for watching football, but nevertheless. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I don't want to go too much, actually, into McNulty about what he says in his report, you've seen it. What we've got to decide here is what we're going to do to stop McNulty coming in. Because you see, Sir Roy McNulty, who made his report, was paid over £200,000. So whoever pays the piper plays the tune, really. And he makes some very interesting decisions in there and recommendations. Some of it, to be honest with you, might take £200,000 to write it beggars belief. He says that all of the other railways in Europe are cheaper than the British ones. Well, I ask the question why? Because they're state owned and our one's privatised. Don't need 200,000 for that. We could tell him that. And even though there are private trains running, for example, in France and Germany, a totally different structure operates, a structure where you've still got a chief executive of the railway company in France and Germany, and they've got overall <coughs> control of the railway network. He says there's too many interfaces in the railway network. Well, we know about that. Well, a simple way of doing away with interfaces is having one company running the railway network. But he also says there should be more cooperation between the TOCs and the network rail. Now, let's go on about what Minolte is really about at the end of the day. He wants a railway company that makes loads of money for a very, very small lot of directors and shareholders, and he wants a railway which is not human, which takes out as many possible workers that work about the railway. Ask passengers what they want, and what they want is a non-expensive railway company which is safe with plenty of staff around the place. That's what people feel safe for, that when they jump on a train, there's a guard, there's a buffet staff, there's collective staff, there's people doing all kinds of nature of work, whether they're infrastructure or what, people feel safe. And he wants to take them away. So where is his consultation that he really done? He went around with a laptop and got data from certain railway companies and said, how do you do your maintenance? Now, you just can't go onto British railways. I'm not a, a hack in the sense of the word, but you've got something in the region of 4,000 Victorian structures on our railway company. You can't turn around and say, because you only give you access to two or, three's engineer, two or three hours engineering hours per night. It's the same as a high-speed line from Madrid to Barcelona, where they've actually it's brand new. And the question is this at the end of the day. Who's the most highly performing TOC at the moment? And it's London Overground. And why it's the most highly performing TOC? It's had brand new infrastructure with brand new trains and it's got people all about the place. And I'll take me out off to Laurel. They put all the staff back in house and they put all in the pension fund and it is a success. Now what we've got to say is this. Is that this is the only railway company in Britain, in the world, where for example if you want the track to be maintained you've got to pay the train operating company to go on there, to repair it, and pay them money so you can't go on there. Network Rail paid £125 million last year to the TOCs to maintain their track so they can run more trains over the track to bring more money. Now, put that into its logical conclusion, if your washing machine breaks down and the, and the fitter comes round your ass and knocks on the door with a pair of overalls, I've come to repair your washing machine, madam or sir, what would you do for some charge you £10 for you coming to want to repair my washing machine? You think you've gone bananas. That's what McNulty is doing on the report. So therefore, how are we going to destroy McNulty's report? And I'll tell you what, it's no coincidence by the way, if you look at what's taking place with McNulty about doing away with as many staff as possible, completely against what the passengers want, have a look at this report that came out yesterday, this so-called leaked report from London Underground. Funny you know, a phone call we had this morning from our legal department 
that the British Transport Police have phoned up and asked, want to know where we got the document from. <coughs> so, you know, there's crimes all over the place, they're nicking copper left, right and there, they're taking sexuals away, and he's worried about where we got the report. I said, what you should be really concerned about, who wrote the report, mate? Because they're in that report. In that report. Travelling public and workers in danger by saying driverless trains. They've only done months until we laugh on the underground. There's more people on an underground train than there is on this new air bus that goes to Singapore from London. That's the possibility you're talking about there. What you're talking about is a train assistant now they're going to have. What's the train assistant going to do when the train breaks down? Go in the front of the train and drive the train. So what they really want to do is just reduce the rate of pay for a train driver. That's what it all boils down to. And they ain't going to get away with it because they've been caught red-handed and the reality is they said, oh, this will take 10 years to do. Well, let me tell you something, and a message just to London Underground, in case any of their spies ain't here today. We're telling London Underground now, we ain't waiting 10 years, mate, for you to get rid of the drivers. You've shown your hand and we'll show our hand. And if you try and take one train driver off any train on London Underground, we'll shut it and you have no trains there now, never mind about having no one with no drivers. <laughs> And the meeting's already taken place between South West Trains and Network Rail about having a joint board from next April next year, which will be half South West Trains, half Network Rail. Where's the shutdown interfaces there? That's not shutdown interfaces. Who are they going to report to? You have one managing director. Who is he or she's liability going to be to? Is it going to be to Network Rail or is it going to be to South West Trains? Sue will be saying, you're liable to me because I want money for the biggest top in Britain. Network Rail will be saying, you're liable to me because I've got to make sure that the trains are safe for the track to go over. It's a nonsense. But the issue is this, if you can have a joint board that runs TOCs and infrastructure, then why can't Network Rail be allowed to run a TOC? That should be the argument. And it's a simple way, you know, all these all this consultants to say, how do we bring the railway network back? How do we do it? It's pretty simple. What you do is you wait for the end of the franchise, if not before, and let them get out, like National Express did, and you take the keys off them and you let the government run. The government's running the East Coast Main Line. And what they should turn around now, this government, the previous government, turned around and said, it's going to stay that way. And when the other franchises run out, we're going to do exactly the same. And we're going to bring it back piece by piece. Because the reality is, brothers and sisters, the railway can't run on the basis of one section against the other. We're all interlinked. And we don't want a slice of the cake, we want the full bakery. And that's not a selfish and a jealous argument, but we want the old entire railways brought back. Now what's happening is that this campaign's got to turn outwards to the public. And what we've got to say to the public, basically, what the structure of affairs was in this country was 60% taxpayer, 40% for the passenger. And now they're reversing it now by these RPI plus 3% increases. You know, fares are going to go up with all the problems of austerity at the moment, but they're going to find an 8% increase for fares in January. Just like they can find the energy prices when they want to put them up. And of course they pay for it now. When you railway workers ask for 3% above the rate of inflation, you'll be called a bunch of greedy bastards. But when they do it, it's good business. Well, I'll tell you what, we've got to turn to these passengers and say, this is what privatisation is really about. And it will get worse and worse unless we start taking state control of all of those companies concerned. You know, Network Rail, for all their solicitors and legal department they've got, they've got 125 dedicated solicitors that look at why trains are late every day. They sit there and say, the train from Waterloo to Guildford was three minutes late. It's your fault to uh, South West Trains. And South West Trains have got, with the rest of the TOCs, another 125 solicitors who say, well, our fault, mate, the car was late, the driver was late. So you've got 250 solicitors sitting there in the railway industry saying, you're three minutes late, you're four minutes late. If you have one industry with one company, you could do away those solicitors straight away and just get on with the real business of running a service. And that's what it boils down to. So therefore, brothers and sisters, these meetings that are taking place here today, this rally, we've got to start opening up into every city. It's got to be unified right across the board with every trade union in the railway industry, both Unite, TSSA and ASLIV, on a joint broad platform that the McNulty proposals are unacceptable, will do away with thousands of jobs, because what you really want to McNulty at the end of the day is that you come up to a station and you get your ticket on the internet, or you use a swipe card, so there'll be no need for ticket offices. And then when you go to the catering staff, they do away with them, you can bring your own catering on. When you want to see the guard, there'll be no guard, because what he's stressing 
is that every franchise that is leased in the future should be driver, it should be one person operation, one person on the train. In the event of something happening, like we've seen in every event that took place, it's all the railway workers, whether they be catering workers, drivers, guards, come to the assistance of the travelling public and evacuate. And that's what we want to keep. And we've got to say to the passengers, you're paying 3% above the rate of inflation for the forthcoming future, and at the same token, you're going to get a worse service for what you're paying for than what you had before. And the likes of Suta, who creamed in a £50 million paying dividend last year, is going to be rolling more and more money in because they want longer franchises, but they don't want the risk. They don't want the risk of the infrastructure. Only if they were to take the infrastructure on, then what they would do is sub it out straight away. The likes of Virgin, if he, if he got all of the infrastructure, what he would do, it'd be like his Virgin mobile phones. He'd give it to a German telecommunications company. Or like West Coast Train Care, he would put the work out to a subcontractor. And that's what it's all about. It's nothing new what McNulty says. The same people were saying things about the railways over 100 years ago. You know what? When two people talk about us being dinosaurs, 110 years ago, at the turn of the century, there was about 120 railway companies in Britain, and basically they led to the big four before the war that become British Rail after the war. And you know where we are 110 years later on? It's like 350 companies out there now, swallowing around the rail, all doing one thing, all competing against each other in some stretch of imagination or another. And what we want is one railway company. And that's what the passengers want, and that's what our argument's got to be, and that's what we've got to convince the Labour Party to do, to put in their manifesto. But I'll tell you what, like yesterday's vote, nationalise the railways and give it back to the public and have a board of directors which was, yes was managed by the board of directors but representatives from the passengers on there and representatives from the workers in there, the people that know the industry inside out, it would gain your popularity, it would win the election purely on that radical policy alone. Yeah. So are fantastic, the lobbying is fantastic, but we just can't wait for the next general election to see if someone's going to put in a manifesto that they're going to save us from McNulty. And I'll tell you where we save ourselves as a trade union, as an independent free trade union. If we feel those proposals are detrimental to our members, detrimental to safety, then we ask our members what we always do, are you prepared to take industrial action and defend them? And I'll tell you what, this ain't just some little small dispute over a pay rise or over safety. This is going to reach out to every single part of the railway network, every single part of it, both London Underground, both the Overground, infrastructure and tops, every railway worker and every passenger. And what we want, if need be, is that if we take industrial action, we make it quite clear, we ain't doing it for a selfish reason, just to take look after ourselves and jobs and pay, but it's to defend our industry and defend the passengers. If the likes of these politicians down the road ain't prepared to defend us, then we do as we always do, is defend ourselves. And I'm asking everyone here to make a pledge. I'm asking everyone here to make a pledge. And if we leave here on the 26th of October, the likes of Billy Rayfield, who's coming into the industry, whatever he decides to do at 18 years of age, I want to know in 60, 70 years' time, when he's retired, he remembered that on the 26th of October in London, in 2011, both railway workers and passengers said, we ain't having them a note in report. He can shove it where he got it from, and we're going to stand determined to say it ain't